uh, you know, this Women's History Month, and uh, we're celebrating it today with three amazing uh, colleagues, uh, role models, and uh, friends uh, who are here uh, to share with us their uh, experience, thoughts. And uh, uh, so, so the format is pretty informal. We let uh, Holly Seifert, Katie Skinner, and Laura Offert to first uh, take the podium to say something. And then we open uh, the floor for questions and discussion. That could be just the free format. Uh, so uh, we start with uh, Halley. So I'm not going to make the introduction. I let the speakers introduce themselves. Thank okay. you, Halley. Thank you, Professor Sun. Then I will share my screen. Let's see if this works. Is it, it's, it, it seems to be working. Is that right? Yeah. yeah, you're good. Okay. Maybe this is at the top. Yeah, here we go. All right. So yeah, indeed, my name is Harley Seifert. I am a graduate of our department. So I did my bachelor's and master's and my PhD in our name department. So I finished the bachelor's in 2014 um, and then finished the PhD in 2018 and then finished the master's sometime in between then. Um, I also did an electrical engineering master's at Michigan, kind of in the middle of all of that. Um, so yeah, this is a first a picture of me at one of my fabulous experiences with this department in a dry dock in South Korea. So this, uh, I always like to remember this, this uh, time when we were there. So one of the things I got to do with our department. Um, yeah, so originally I'm from New Jersey and then came to Michigan, yeah, for undergrad and stayed all the way through. And I thought of going to other places for the PhD, but couldn't leave Michigan. It was too much fun. Professor Troche said he was interested in another student, so I couldn't let down the opportunity. So stayed there all the way through. Um, so a few things that I did while at Michigan, um, a few summers I worked at the MHL, um, East Hall, is that what they called it? One summer we were paid to power wash the entire tank and repaint it. Um, that was a fun experience. So it was really cool when they drained the entire tank and we could walk through. So we did that and then also helped a little bit with some experiments. I'm not sure how much I actually helped, but it was a great experience for me. Um, and then I did two internships while at Michigan, um, both with Chevron. So that was a good experience. Well, one year, one summer was a really great experience. My second summer was not a great experience, but it worked out because it made me realize that I'd rather go do a PhD than work there, which probably uh, looking back was a, was a good choice. Um, but I had some good experiences there, met a lot of cool people. So that was two summers in Houston. Um, one, uh, one thing I really loved about being in our department was a lot of the experiences I got. So obviously, like I said, uh, I was in Korea. So I'm not sure if the department still does this, but for one summer, me along with, I think there were 10 of us students from Michigan. So we went to the Hyundai shipyard in South Korea. So that's where this is from in the dry dock. Um, so that was a very interesting experience. We really just got to see all over the shipyard. And in honor of Women's History Month, because of being a woman in that shipyard, somebody told me that they rarely see Western women walking around in the shipyard. And when they do, they think they're executives. So we basically got to go see everything because they really said, oh, we can go around with this lady and we can go to places that we're not usually allowed to go. So we actually went to the top of one of these cranes, one of the Goliath cranes, which was really cool. And then another year during spring break, um, I went to the Ingalls shipyard in Pascagoula, um, Mississippi. Also a fun experience. So just to see, yeah, get that ex get a, a different view of how things are done. I'm not necessarily the most hands-on person, honestly, but I really liked being able to see that. Um, so then, as I also mentioned, I did my PhD with Professor Trosh. Uh, obviously, this is Laura. This was at my first conference in St. John's, Newfoundland, Canada. Um, so doing the PhD, I really loved it. Got to experience a lot and go to a lot of different places. 
We went to Japan, we went to Copenhagen for different um, conferences, PhD graduation. Thankfully, I got to do that when everything was still in person. And then actually the last year of my PhD, I worked remotely, not from the White House, but from Washington, DC. So I was working remotely for a year when it was completely not required by COVID, but it was a really good experience. I was really grateful that I got to do that. So that was basically the last year of my PhD. And I worked remotely because I had married another name grad and he really honestly just couldn't find a job in Ann Arbor. So we ended up moving to Michigan for his work or moving to Washington DC for his job. Um, and then finished the PhD in 2018. And now I live in the Netherlands. This is where I live. It's a very beautiful town. It's basically like living in Disney World. So I moved to Delft in the Netherlands to do a postdoc um, in 2018, I think uh, September of 2018, and then transitioned to the tenure track um, in March of 2020, I guess. So this is my current uh, work from home view. It's, it's pretty fabulous. So I really love living in the Netherlands, like my job there. It's a great experience. And one thing I really love about it is I get to work four days a week and I get to spend uh, one day at home with my son. So that's a, a perk of working in Europe. I guess part-time work is really normal. So that's something really special. And, uh, and then what I do there is similar to my, uh, basically my PhD research, looking at extreme waves and extreme events due to those waves. So that's kind of what I do there at TU Delft. Um, in, um, yeah, so I do a lot of research. I supervise masters and PhD students and work on funding for hiring new people. So that's a, that's the the main. Where am I? Where where are you all? Stop. Oh, sorry. Stop screen sharing. Yeah. So that's a that's that's my journey. I guess pretty short. I've just started, um, but I've had a lot of great experiences. Really grateful for all of the help I've gotten from Michigan. All of uh, the support. And it's nice to be back to talk with you all. Awesome update. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Hallie. Uh, we'll move on to Katie. Um, yep. Let me share my screen. OK, can you see my slides? Cool. Um, so this kind of goes all the way back <laughs> through my journey, uh, kind of how I got um, into engineering and how I came to Michigan. Um, so I'm going to start from the beginning, but first I wanted to show kind of, um, this is just my biography that I show like my first day of class. And I've realized over the last few classes I've taught, it's just kind of um, dry. So I think it talks a lot about, you know, uh, my professional experience, um, but it isn't necessarily relatable. So I'm happy to be able to share some more background on how I, um, on my path as a woman in STEM. Um, but I'm currently an assistant professor in name and robotics at Michigan. I did my undergrad at Princeton in mechanical and aerospace engineering. And I did my master's and my PhD in robotics at University of Michigan, working in marine robotics. So with research in the name department. Um, I actually grew up in Riverhead, New York, which is on Long Island. Uh, whenever I say I'm from New York, everyone assumes that meant I grew up in New York City but it is quite different from that. Um, it's mostly farms and beaches out on the east end of Long Island. And um, I grew up being able to walk to really nice beaches like this and doing a lot of um, activities out on the water pretty much my whole childhood. Um, and the rest of Long Island is made up of sod farms and pumpkin farms. <laughs> uh, so that's kind of what we're known for too. But I wanted to, I kind of, Started, started thinking about how I got into STEM and how I got into science. And I think a lot of it was really how I grew up. Um, my mom was actually my high school physics teacher, <laughs> which is kind of a unique experience um, to go to first period class with my mom as my teacher. Um, but I think that uh, I was really lucky to have that because uh, she always encouraged me to pursue science and um, pursue math. So that was something that was really, um, that was really important, I think, in me finding STEM as a career. I was also a runner uh, in high school and college, and I think just the team aspect of being part of a team and working with others um, was really important to me. 
And of course, growing up on Long Island, I had a lot of opportunities to go fishing. Um, this bottom picture I found is actually, uh, we had an annual week fish competition. And one year I won a trophy and I just remember going up to get it. And I was the only girl in the room even then. <laughs> so uh, I think even at a young age, Age, I was maybe used to being uh, one of the only females or girls in the room um, for you know my hobbies and activities that I enjoyed. Uh, for college, I I ended up going to Princeton for my undergrad, and I was I was really unsure of what I wanted to do, but all I knew was that I really liked math a lot, um, and I really liked physics, and I actually ended up um, starting in the ORC program, which is Operations Research and Financial Engineering. Uh, because it seemed like a really unique program. It's in the engineering school at Princeton, uh, but it's more of an applied math program. Uh, so that was kind of my motivation, but I didn't really know. <laughs> I didn't really know what it was at all. Uh, but I joined the track team. So I had a nice support group all throughout college, which is also really nice. Um, I guess one thing is there was only one other engineer on the team, which was kind of, kind of interesting to me. Uh, so I didn't have a lot of female engineers in my in my crew. Um, freshman year, I think my main realization was that college is really hard. I was able to take a lot of classes, uh, physics, calc, programming. So that was the first time I had done programming. And then at the end of my freshman year, I did an internship at Brookhaven National Lab, which is in the Department of Energy, um, kind of in applied math for smart grid optimization to see if I liked it. <laughs> and, I uh, realized that maybe it wasn't uh, what I wanted to do. That's me <laughs> in the crowd. Um, a couple of other things that were really, I think, useful for me my freshman year in figuring out how, uh, figuring out what I wanted to do um, as a career was my course advising. I started realizing that I wasn't really taking the courses that maybe an, a financial engineer should be taking. I hadn't taken a single econ class my whole freshman year, so that was kind of a hint that like maybe I didn't want to do that uh, for my career. Um, and then I had a really, really great mentor in my freshman year physics professor. Um, and uh, I had kind of a, an interesting experience my freshman year physics class. I was the first day of class, I was called on to do a problem in front of everyone at the board and I just totally completely froze, um, which is I think maybe the classic, you know, freshman engineering horror story or nightmare and it happened to me. And I survived that um, and ended up, you know, working really hard. I went to every single office hours um, this professor had. And um, at the end of it, he kind of started talking in, talking me into um, following physics or following physics more as a career path. And I think that was something that really stuck in my head. Um, he actually he actually mentioned that I could be because I said, you know, I don't I don't see myself as a physicist. I'm not sure what I would. Um, do as a physicist and he said oh there's a lot of degrees that you can or there's a lot of paths that you can take being a physics major or being an engineering major um, so you know you can be a patent lawyer or you can uh, you can be an engineer and there were that was something that really stuck in my head um, when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do but mainly I realized after freshman year that I didn't want to be a financial engineer so I had to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. I ended up switching to mechanical and aerospace engineer engineering, mainly because I thought about it and I realized that uh, mechanical engineering was one of the most broad majors. You can really dip into every other kind of engineering major from mechanical engineering. So that was really exciting to me. Um, and I did another internship my sophomore year in mechanical design and being able to work hands-on with 3D printing and with SolidWorks um, as like a hands-on experience really just I, that really just clicked with me, and that was something that made me realize that I was in the right place. Um, but I also really loved my programming classes, so I decided to minor in computer science. Uh, this was my senior thesis project. I worked uh, in a group of five, of course, the only, <laughs> only girl in that group, uh, but we built a seaplane. And um, I you know, had never worked in uh, any kind of engineering by the water, so this experience, I think, was really helpful for me in realizing that, oh, there are things you can do um, for a living by the water. And I started to think about, you know, maybe there's maybe there's another path um, that I can take that would let me kind of bring both um, my interest in engineering and my interest in um, the ocean together. So when I was thinking about what to do next, um, the end of my junior year, I actually kind of 
stumbled into <laughs> this career path, I would say. I was Googling ocean engineering, um, things you could do in ocean engineering or internships so I could learn more. Uh, and I found this article from Popular Science Magazine about the coolest labs in the country and found this lab in Woods Hole that was uh, building underwater robots. And I just really had never thought about this <laughs> as something you could do. So I, yeah, I kind of found my career path on Google, I think. Um, but what I, what I ended up doing was I found that they had an internship program and I just, I emailed so many people <laughs> to try to find a mentor in this program. Um, and I ended up getting a fellowship uh, internship there the summer before my senior year, uh, working with the Remus 6000. Um, so I was working to design a lightweight, a more lightweight vehicle that could have longer endurance um, for longer missions. And I think this is maybe one of the most important experiences I've had um, in my career path because it was really the field work experience during this summer internship uh, where I was able to see, you know, an underwater vehicle dive down and then I think she might have lost her internet connection. Sorry about that. Um, I, think, I think I was on this slide, but pretty much done. Was, was that about it? Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, after uh, this internship experience, I decided that I wanted to learn more about ocean engineering and marine robotics and that I really wanted to become um, an expert in the field. Um, so I, I was looking for uh, graduate school programs and I was specifically looking for schools that had um, kind of powerhouses in robotics and in marine engineering and found uh, Michigan through another Google search <laughs> that they had both robotics and naval architecture and marine engineering as a major, um, which is incredibly unique and something um, that I think makes Michigan really stand out um, from other places. So I applied to the naval architecture program and um, I reached out to both uh, Matt Johnson Robertson, who became my PhD advisor, and Ryan Eustace in the name department. Um, and I had several video calls with them and came to campus. And uh, they pitched to me that robotics was starting a PhD program that year. Um, and that was something that was just a really exciting opportunity to me to be able to be one of the first, uh, one of the first Michigan PhD uh, robotics students. So I think pretty much as soon as I came to campus um, and heard about all of the opportunities at Michigan, and I saw really the collaborative and interdisciplinary environment here. Um, I, I made a pretty easy decision, maybe one of my easiest decisions, uh, to join the first PhD class um, in robotics at Michigan. And I think one of the other things that really helped is when I came for my visit, there were just uh, so many female role models. Um, I, I met John Tilbury and Ella Atkins in robotics, and I think that was the first time I had really um, I, I never had a female professor in undergrad in engineering, um, and I rarely worked with other female students um, in my classes because there weren't many of us. Um, so I think just having role models uh, at Michigan was something that also really influenced my decision to come here. And I really got to do everything I wanted <laughs> during my PhD experience. Um, I was really lucky that my group focused both on uh, developing software and algorithms, but also on the fieldwork component of underwater robotics. So I had just a, a lot of really exciting opportunities um, to do fieldwork all around the world um, with many different kinds of underwater robots. So we had several uh, diver rigs where we worked with marine biologists um, to collect images of coral reefs. Um, we also had an autonomous surface vehicle where we uh, took images of a submerged city in Jamaica and then we had uh, an ROV or remotely operated vehicle uh, we took to Hawaii for some underwater surveys. So I had a lot of hands-on experiences at Michigan, um, which was really, really exciting for me. Um, and then my research focused mainly on sensing and perception for marine robotics. So doing tasks like underwater image restoration, being able to correct underwater images um, to restore the color of them so we can accurately study the, coral, the color of coral reef systems and then developing um, methods that could perform 3D reconstruction of underwater scenes. So this is the 3D model of the submerged city in Jamaica and then 
a 3D model of a large coral reef system in Bermuda. I also had a lot of other experience in, experiences in grad school that were really important, um, I think, in finding my end, my end uh, career path. Um, I did a summer fellowship. It was a research fellowship at the University of Sydney. So this is my obligatory koala picture. Um, I also got to travel a lot for international conferences, and that was something that um, it was really exciting for me to see all of the work in the field and to go to different presentations. And that was something that really fed my curiosity and my um, my own way of thinking about my research. And I also did a summer internship in industry uh, at NVIDIA, uh, which I think maybe helped me realize that I wanted to stay in academia and work on underwater robotics. Um, but it was still really important for me to have that experience. And of course, I, I wanted to keep my work-life balance <laughs> meaningful, um, have meaningful outside experiences. So I. I found a way to fish in Michigan too, um, in the ice. <laughs> so when I chose, when I was choosing my career, I was really deciding between academia and industry. But um, after thinking about it, I realized I just um, love working in marine robotics, and I love working on the research questions uh, that I was able to work on in grad school. And I still had a lot of ideas for what I wanted to work on for the future. And um, I think that Michigan is just still such a unique place that we have both naval architecture. In marine engineering but we also have a robotics institute and we have uh, engineering departments across so many different areas that are all top 10 departments um, across in their own fields um, in their own right so i think that's something that just makes michigan a really unique place um, and on top of that it's just such a collaborative environment which is uh, really important to me um, in working here i did a brief postdoc in space robotics <laughs> because there's a lot of interest right now in using uh, underwater vehicles for uh, exploration on Europa and um, on other ocean worlds. So I was able to work with uh, data collected from an ASPIN AUV, which works in Antarctica, uh, using Antarctica as a proxy for um, space refer Europa missions. But just some final uh, thoughts, I think, <laughs> from my following my path. Um, to hear is just to try as many things as possible. I try to take as many experiences as I could. Um, I also try to keep all of my doors open. I never, I think I didn't decide whether I wanted to do academia or industry until the very end, but I just kept all of my doors open throughout grad school and that was really helpful. Um, to be proactive, to um, you know, email potential mentors and find potential advisors uh, on your own. And to find you know, mentors and role models that you can relate to, I think is also just a really important uh, thing to have. So that is all I have. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Thank you, Katie. Laura, you, uh, uh, you, you muted. Hang on, I was trying to write the message in the chat room to thank Katie. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was so great to have Laura and stuff about you. All right. <laughs> Hopefully Zoom will stay and we won't crush it again. Now, when I got asked to do this panel, it was, I said, I, did, I agreed, but under the condition that I could do the entire talk solely in memes because I'm tired of telling my life story with like all the usual stuff. So that's what we're gonna do. I hope you like it. I spent way too much time working on these instead of like, you know, writing exam questions and stuff like that. So here we go. All right, let me hide some floating meeting control so I can see. All right, so this is all about me in memes. Um, uh, I can't, this actually worked out really well going last because I can like tie in some different things. But so I am a lecturer and some of you may have had me in class. I, there are some friendly faces in the audience. I know that you have. Um, but if you don't know me, I teach the first year courses. So um, historically engineering 100, the ROV course, and then engineering 101, the programming course. All right, so I, this will be a different path through, but it's still ending up in academia. So if you have questions about industry, I guess you have to talk to somebody else. Um, but yeah, so let's get going. Uh, if I can advance these slides. All right, so the first thing is you heard all of these great stories about people traveling and internships. I did not do any of that because I'm like not an adventurer. So I grew up in St. Joe Benton Harbor, also near a like, the water, right? So it's on Lake Michigan, not that my house is on Lake Michigan or anything like that. But that's where I grew up. And then I came to Ann Arbor to go to Michigan as an undergrad in engineering. And that was in 98. And I just haven't left. So 
clearly I really love the university and apartments and stuff like that. But like all those cool stories about things that people did, yeah, that's not me. You, you go talk to other people about that. Anyways, so when I came here, I came be partly because in high school, I came to Tech Day and I got to see all the wind tunnels for aerospace engineering. I was like, oh man, those are so cool. So I went back home, I told everybody that I was gonna do aerospace engineering. And then I came here and like, you meet people like at the bus station and stuff like that because you end up having the same schedule. And so I met this person and she grew up in Traverse City. So she knew about sailing and she was going to major in naval architecture. And I was like, what is naval architecture? I'm marine engineer. It's like, it's all about boats. I was like, dude, you can get a degree in that? That's amazing. So I came, I took NA270 and it was so amazing, probably because it's about boats. And so, but also I really liked the systems aspect of it. It wasn't like this one specific thing. It was the hull and the structure and the dynamics and the powering and it was the whole thing. And I really, really liked that. So definitely towing tanks, better than wind tunnels. All right. So I go through undergrad, right? And I, I my, uh, my graduating class, I only had nine other people. It was very small. Four of us were women. So technically we had a 40% rate at the time, but I'm getting to the end and like, oh man, like I really love naval architecture. But it's really broad. And I was like, if I go get a job and somebody says, here, help me design this ship. I was like, I didn't feel like I would know enough. But I, I'll stay for another year and I'll get a master's degree and I'll just go take another round of all, all the classes and then I will feel better. And so I'm like, I'm going to do a master's degree. And so Professor Trosh, who is responsible for two-thirds of the people on this panel, which is quite hilarious, said like, well, have you thought about getting a PhD? And I was like, no, he said, what if we will pay for it? And I said, deal, because PhDs do not go bad. Like there's no expiration date on them. So I knew no matter what I did, if I got a real job, if I was in academia, I had kids and was out of the workforce a little bit, like it didn't matter. I would always have this degree. Plus I just really liked Michigan and learning stuff. So I was like, I will totally say it and get a PhD. All right. So that put me on a wonderful path of making cartoons. It turns out that if you can take what your dissertation is and put it into cartoon format, people could understand it a lot better. So um, believe it or not, like that is like one of the core skills I feel like I really got was like, was visuals, but you know, all this kind of stuff. So, and as part of that, right, Professor Trush was really great, took us to, took me to conferences and stuff. So that same picture that Harley showed before of this conference I went to in Newfoundland, that is what this picture is from. They had a frozen fish and if you kissed the fish, you became an honorary Newfoundlander. It was very disgusting, but oh my goodness, did we have an epic time at that conference. We had like a little like, oh yeah. So like we rented an Airbnb house. This was like like at the very beginning of Airbnb and Harley and I got it. And we threw like a little like Michigan, like party and stuff. That was, that was a very epic night. <laughs> it was a good time. Um, but it wasn't all fun and games for me and going to conferences. There was one time and this like is ingrained in my head. We submitted a paper. I don't remember what conference it was for, but it was in Rio de Janeiro. And like Professor Church, like all excited, like we're gonna go. And then he found out he couldn't go. And he's like, "Well, that's okay. You can go on your own." I was like, "Remember the Bilbo Baggins, different before. I'm not a traveler." I was like, "This was terrifying." For many nights in a row, I could not sleep. I was so scared about this. So finally, I had to go into Professor Church's office. I was like, "I can't do this. I can't sleep. I am terrified. I cannot do this." And Professor Charles said, all right, so do it himself. And I realized that this is a villain of the Avengers, but Professor Charles never ever made me feel bad. This was not something that I could do at the time. And I don't actually remember now if, if he ended up going, I think we maybe got like a, a somebody we knew that was already gonna go like to present, to present the paper and the presentation for us. But, like, but he, just, he just took it, he recognized like, all right, you can't do this. Like, I will make it happen. And like, I really, really appreciated that. Like he did not, I already felt bad enough that I couldn't do this thing. He never made me feel bad. He, I got nothing but wonderful support from Professor Troy. All right. So I go through all of that and I get to PhD and now it's like time to get a real job. And I had one internship actually technically after I graduated with my BS, uh, my bachelor's degree. And then I had like, I was sort of working with other people and that like really was not working well for various reasons. And at the same time, uh, we had a guy who was teaching Engine 100, but he took a different job. And so Professor Trish was like, how do you feel about teaching Engine 100? And I was like, I was kind of interested in teaching. I really like U of M. My family's all in Michigan. Sure, I'll teach Engine 100. So, okay, I did that. 
And that was lots of fun. But then it was sort of like, okay, I also at the same time, like starting to have some kids and trying to figure out like, how do I balance this? And at the time, like, I didn't really have a formal position in the department. It was like, I was teaching Engine 100 once a, once a year. It wasn't even both terms. It was just sort of thing. So I started like, all right, what can I do? So I go to like everybody in the department that I know. And again, I have been in the department for a long time at this point. I was like, does anybody have anything I can do? I got some bills I got to pay. And so these are some of like the bigger things that I worked on over the course of many years. So again, like part-time work, some teaching of Engine 100 in, in and of this. So like I worked with Professor Mackey doing some computational fluid dynamic stuff. Um, I worked with Professor Beck on just environmental and ship motion forecasting. This is a Navy contract, which is different from a grant, as I found out. Um, and then I did some stuff with the Naval Engineering Education Center with Professor Singer. And um, this, most of what I did for the NEAT, which is what I called it, um, were these YouTube videos. And you see, like, they get a lot of views. And in them, this is the hilarious part, is that, like, so my name is on there, but I don't even, I don't think I even say Michigan, but people will find me. They find me, they find my email, and they will send me emails. It's like, just last week, I got I think one email from somebody who was like writing a book and wanted my help with it. I, I say no to all this stuff, but like the both funny and creepy part is that I also get things like, again, this happened last week from a different person. The entirety of the email was a subject line that said, I saw your videos on YouTube and you're gorgeous. That is creepy. You should not do that. One time I actually got a guy who sent me his resume as a pickup line based on YouTube videos, which it was a very good resume, but still, this is kind of creepy, so please do not do that. Um, but like, it's just bizarre, like you put some stuff out there and people find you. But I do get like a lot of emails from people saying that they really love these videos, they are very helpful. They are like, so again, all the thing about cartoons and visuals, those those hydrostatics videos, has that's, that's pretty much all they are. So it's putting all these skills to good use. All right, so remember that big ESNS project, right? So every quarter there was this big report that was due and it was, this is part of the reason why I got brought on was to help us make sure that we got these reports due. So like every single quarter, like, oh no, we gotta get the report done. And now we're getting kind of close to dinner. It's like, oh man, this would be so great. I can't wait to not have to do these reports anymore. It's like, oh no, if there's no ESF project, I don't have a job. What am I gonna do? So I'm right, thinking, I probably ought to get my life in order at this point. So fall 2015, like, all right. I still got some research going on with the ESNS and some other things. But you know, I always thought about teaching Engine 101, the programming course. And this goes back to when I took Engineering 101 and I did not find it all that useful. I was like, I could teach this better. So I went to uh, Professor Brian Noble, who was the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Education at the time. And he's like, you know, Brian, I want to teach this course. And he's like, oh yeah, nobody wants to teach this course. Sure, come on. So again, like going to like the KU thing was like, you know, like you, just, you have to find the opportunities and the stuff. So, so I started doing that, and then winter 2016 was sort of wrapping up ESMF, and I was still teaching Engine 100. And then it sort of worked out that the people that were teaching Engine 100 and 101 sort of opposite me were both rotating off, and ESMF was ending. So like, you know what? I figured out I can I can do research totally fine, and I write good reports and all that stuff. But I didn't get nearly as much joy out of it as I did with teaching. So all right can I turn this teaching thing into a full-time gig? And so I talked to Brian Noble again and with, um, I don't even remember who was chair at the time. might have been Sekia who was chair. I was like, look, this is what I want to do. I want to become a full-time lecturer and teach these two courses. Nobody wants to. I think I do a pretty good job at it. And I like it. I really like the first year students. And so they said, yeah, let's do it. And so then now all of a sudden, I have an actual title as a lecturer and I have steady pay and my benefits don't keep getting messed up like every four months because like my title keeps changing for all this stuff. So it's like, whoa, this is getting pretty awesome. Right. So I do this for a few years. Things are going pretty well, busy, very busy, but like I'm getting the hang of it. Then COVID happens. So this is last year, right? And so now it's like, okay, so we've got the pandemic. We're gonna have to switch to remote teaching like okay like what is this what is this going to mean in terms of teaching obviously like my job is a teacher so i'm going to teach but like, what exactly is it going to look like right. so ng100 is the rov course it is really difficult to uh remotely do something in the towing thing so we said all right we're not going to offer that so we'll say we're having technical difficulties and we will bring the rov section back just as soon as we possibly can in the meantime engine 101 the programming course right 
So again, like, how do we do this properly online? So my co-instructor, uh, Dr. James Dewitt said, what do you think about doing a website instead of Canvas? And I was like, I don't know. Like, I don't know HTML. So he goes and he grabs like this format from, he still has an E380, and he showed it to me over the summer. And I was like, oh, that's really pretty. Okay, fine, we'll do the website. And so now, he, like, so he set it up, but now like I am updating like the HTML and I'm using GitHub and like all of this stuff. And he's like, oh yeah, you know, that means that you're a web developer now. I said, that is a terrible thing to accuse me of. <laughs> but I'm continuing to learn all of these different things. And like, I'm not an expert in any of this stuff, but like the idea of being able to like always picking up new things, don't be, don't be afraid, like just go, go and try. So anyway, so that's 101. Um, and remember the video, right? So we decided that, yeah, we're not going to do, I didn't want to try and do synchronous Zoom lectures for like 200 people twice a week. That sounded insane. So he said, all right, what if instead we've been talking about trying to make basically like an online interactive textbook for a number of years anyway? So like, all right, COVID's going to make it happen. So we found this platform called Roomstone. And Roomstone will let you like embed videos and then you can have little exercises. People can try it out. It's highly interactive. It's been very successful. But it meant we had to go record all these videos and Runestone works in something called restructured text, which is like the worst thing that's ever been invented. So while I can like copy and paste and change stuff, it sucks and drives us nuts, but still making it happen. All right. However, this is really now starting to get to be me trying to teach both of these courses. And it was, it was, I kept trying to say, like, well, maybe next year it'll be better, next semester will be better. But last semester when I was trying to do both, and we were doing a different version of NG100, and they're really sort of crystallized, like, yeah, it's not really getting any better. In some ways, it's getting worse. And so I was like, all right, this is like, I was not sleeping well because I wasn't getting enough. Like my health was suffering. My ability to support my family was suffering. Like all this, I'm like, this is, okay, this is not working. So I go to Professor Sun, Sun, sorry. And I say, James, all right, look, I've been thinking about this. I've got too many co-instructors. I have too many GSIs and IAs. I've got too many students. I have too many courses. Like I can't handle this. I'm, I'm breaking down. And I don't have the, the mental capacity and the rest to have the empathy that I really want to have for our first year students. It's like, all right, what I want to do is I want to teach just one of the courses, but I teach two sections and then that would be full time. And Jing was the one, she's like, you know, like whatever you need to do, like I fully support you. And I've been, I, I cannot tell you how much that I appreciated that because I've been talking with some other lecturers like across the university and a lot of them do not get that kind of support. They get a lot of pushback. They don't really get a say in what they teach. So like, I, I cannot tell you how much it meant to just be like, yep, like whatever you need. Like, like I, oh, I've always felt completely supported by this department. So, so I'm teaching on just engine 101 right now. I still do a little bit of research. It is very much um, around the courses that I teach. So we do things like looking like, at you know, like implicit bias, stereotype threat, things like that. So in inclusive teaching with the courses, but like try something out, try to evaluate and see if it actually works or not. Because if it's something that's taking up a lot of time and effort for us and the students, but it's not really having an effect, we should not use it. We should do something else. Um, I actually got a diversity, like a best diversity paper award at ASE 2019. Um, so that's the American Society for Engineering Education. That's really the only conference that I go to. Um, it's usually domestic. So the whole, like, it's less scary to travel. It's like going to Salt Lake City or something. Um, so that that's good, but like, and, but it it is a really, really I love I love that con that conference. I have met people around the country. There are just, just so many really awesome things with education, engineering education. So it's all awesome, fun. And then the other big one in terms of research is uh, tandems, which some of you I think have used in mostly in Engine 100, but hopefully some other things. This is an online platform that we're developing with the Center for Academic Innovation. And the idea is it will help you all have a more successful teaming experience, but it also helps the faculty support the teams better. So that is an ongoing process. So again, a little bit of research in there, but mostly the big thing is teaching. So that was like my life story, but I always want to end with this. So if you ever really want to know like what gets me excited, I pretty much always have like something that's going on that I am obsessed with. So the first one sort of way back in high school, if you ever really want to understand me, go read Robert Heinlein's Number of the Beast. There is a woman who is a programmer in it. She's one of the four main characters. And thinking back on it, it's like, 
oh yeah, that might be where I got into programming and stuff. So anyway, so there's always like something new. I just had to squeeze in the Manners and Monsters book for this presentation. So I, I got to make all the pictures smaller next time. But you can see like, a lot of these are, are team-based things. Like I had this big long thing about how every engineering team is really like the original Avengers and also Hamilton and Act One, all kinds of stuff. Um, but this kind of thing, I, I tend to show it to students and like, they'll, like people will latch on to one. Like, I had some person randomly come to office hours this uh, this semester because they saw this and they saw leverage. And I've never known anybody else that likes leverage. And I was like, oh, can we talk for like an hour about how often leverage was? So anyway, that is me and that is all my news. Cool, oh, thank you so much. Well, it has been, I, I really enjoyed all the talks. You know, this amazing uh, women uh, came from different places and go through different journey and we end up at different place right now, but you can all feel their passion and the, the fun they are having and the love for the, for, for, for uh, you know, uh, for what they do. But anyway, I, I thought that now let's just uh, have a casual informal chat and uh, have maybe the audience ask questions. Anyone? We have, uh, we don't have many people, so we don't need uh, uh, traffic control. Uh, so you can just. Uh, uh, I had a question for Haley. Um, if I pronounced that correctly. Um, is she still on here? Yeah. yeah. Um, so you worked at Chevron. Um, you said for two summers, one summer you said it wasn't that great. It was one summer you said it was good. So I really just wanted you to share a little bit more about um, what you did, particularly as far as like work at Chevron and also why it wasn't the best the second time you went. And also third question, since you do, because I am pursuing electrical engineer minor. So I wanted to know um, how do you apply um, your elect electrical engineering uh, master's degree to what you do now? Sure. Okay, so yeah, indeed, I did two summers internship at Chevron. The first summer, I loved it. I was in, was it like global response and concepts, motion, I don't remember how it was called, but I was looking at um, like the SPAR platforms having vortex induced vibration and moving and fatigue life. And I got to make this big code in Python and use these tools to try and basically validate some contractor work they got. So two contractors told them something very different about the fatigue life of one of their of one of their platforms. So I got to validate it. And what I really liked was I thought it was interesting. It was pretty clear application to what we had learned in, in classes. And then what was really neat is that another Michigan PhD who eventually got a job there, he came and like recoded what I did so that it was more efficient, but it felt like they actually used it. So I loved that summer. And so obviously I was like, oh, I'll definitely go back there the next summer. The next summer I was in a different group. Um, the reason it wasn't good, I think it was just a management thing. Honestly, I didn't really like my project. I was working for a guy who I think had just himself started there. So he was really not, he basically didn't want to deal with me. That was really the truth is like, anytime I tried to say like, oh, I'd like to do this. He was too concerned about what he was doing for his job, fair enough, to invest the time in me in my internship. And then when, so I didn't like my project, I was basically told, no, don't do this, no, don't do that. And then when I kind of presented it, I heard from them, well, we just thought you weren't all that interested in what you were doing. Why didn't you do more? And actually my boss was like, you didn't seem that happy. Why didn't you make cookies for the group? So like, yeah, exactly. You know, that oh, I heard that. Really said that. Oh yeah. My boss was like, you didn't seem like a team player. Why didn't you bring us cookies? And I was like, oh, wow. Okay. I would have never Not expected forever. that from Chevron. I've heard so many good things, but you know, it's good to hear both sides of, you know, and that, that may have just been the group you're in, you know? I think it was a very unusual experience because like I said, my first summer, I absolutely loved it. So and, and this is connected to, I think, what both Laura and Katie said, keep your doors open. So that summer they said, well, do you want to come back? Because basically they offer everyone a job. And I didn't tell the management what happened because I really didn't want to burn that bridge. I was like, you know, I don't want to come back, but maybe one day I'll want to. 
So I said, no, I want to go do the PhD. And looking back, I'm glad that I did it, but it was a weird experience. So that's why I didn't go back. Um, and then you asked about electrical engineering. Yes. Yeah, so I did during doing the PhD, you pick up so many courses, you basically can get two masters. So I followed like the digital signal processing track in yeah. electrical engineering. So not really electrical, but electrical. Mm -hmm. I use it a lot in my research today, um, looking at some of these digital signal processing techniques. So it is really helpful and people love it. You say you're an electrical engineer and people are like, wow. That's amazing. So I, I actually bring that out a lot and I'm like, oh, and I also have this other degree. So I think it's also good to, especially when you're doing research, you get really in depth with something. It's nice to show that you have experience in other things. So I know a lot of people did a dual masters and they did in mechanical, which is really cool. And I'm sure they gained great experience, but like Ah, mechanical, naval architecture, ah, you know, what's all that different about that? Yeah, I, I know it's different, but, you know, so I think um, it's nice to be a bit broad. So I do use it in my research very shortly. Yeah, I use it for like, now we're trying to put sensors on board ships and monitor fatigue life. And I can kind of use some of what I learned from that class to be able to do that. Right. Um, okay, yeah, that sounds interesting. Did you, were you able to pick what group you wanted to go into when you worked at Chevron or is kind of like they just put you where they needed to? It was a bit random. I got hired. Uh, I no, I didn't get to pick the group. It was just, I, I think it was a little random to be honest. Okay. Yeah. And I was thinking about with my minor, if I didn't, I, I was, I was deciding between taking a digital uh, signals processing uh, path or taking power systems. I like oh. power systems too, though. So we'll see which ones. That's probably more useful. People like electricity. I I don't like electricity. Yeah, I, I tell people that, I'm like electrical engineering, but it's not anything to do with electricity. So yeah. that's, that sounds really good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for answering my questions. Yeah, you're welcome. Other people have questions. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody, for presenting. This has been really cool. I know this is kind of a vague question, but <laughs> if you could give one piece of advice to undergrad female name students, what would it be? I would say you need to you need to believe in yourself because for a long time other people won't. Like that's how I felt. Is like being the only girl in the class, everybody thinks you're stupid. You're the only one that shows up to office hours. Like for a long time, people will look at you or that's how I felt and be like, what are you doing here? And honestly, I felt like I had to work harder. I showed up to every office hours, but you know, at the end of it, the professors knew me. I think Katie mentioned the same thing. Like, yeah, you show up to office hours, you talk to them. People do want to help you. But I think uh, I felt like I had to work harder and I had to believe in myself more because it's just, a, and I still deal with this as confidence. So even when you don't feel confident, you should be like, you know what, I'm here. I have as much right as anyone to be here. And you just uh, keep doing it. I think that's a really good reminder. <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah, I think the confidence, the confidence point is really important. And one way to build confidence is to make sure that you're getting the hands-on experience. Uh, that will give you confidence. And I think one thing that happens um, working, you know, in groups of mostly male students with one female student is, you know, the female student will usually get put on, you know, why don't you go write the report? Or why don't you go make the figures? Um, and I think one thing is to make sure that, you know, you're a little bit proactive and saying like, oh, well, I want to do the SolidWorks model or like, oh, I want to build, you know, you, you need to be a little bit proactive in making sure that you get the experiences that are um, going to, you know, build your confidence in what you're doing. Um, so I think that's, that's one bit of advice that I would have for, for undergrads. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. I would probably say that it's also okay to say no to stuff, especially now. If you, and it seems like this is only getting worse, but undergrads come in and like you come out of high school where you had like, you know, take every single AP class and be on band and track and do drama club and and, and volunteer at the Humane Society and like all of this stuff, like in order to get into college. If you keep going with that much stuff, like you will burn out and you will fail. Like it's just, it's, it's just too much. 
And so I think it's okay, like to try a few things, like find something that you think really fits you. And like, and it doesn't take long to figure out something that doesn't work for you, right? Like that's also like, like Katie was showing in person, like it's, it's good to also find out where you're like, yeah, that's just not for me. But when you find something that can work, like focus on that you can put in more time and more effort and get more valuable experiences if you're focusing more on doing a good job in one thing so like i was on the human powered submarine team and like i learned a lot you know like as being part of that as opposed to like trying to do lots of other different things too so i also i forgot i was going to tell this story um so harley saying like you got to have confidence and stuff so when she, i was working at the mhl as like one of my completely random jobs to try to pay the bills and I'm sitting there and this person just comes like walking in and is like, hi, I'm Harley. Like, are you guys hiring? I'd like a job. And I was just like, who is this person that just like came in and asked for a job? And I was kind of like, well, yeah, we kind of, we need some help. So here, let's go talk to the person that does this. But like, that's how she started working at the MHL. But it really was like, just like walking right in off the street kind of a thing. And I was like, yeah, props to you. Like, I, and I remember thinking, like, I don't think I could do that. I was like, that's a much braver person than me. <laughs> that's amazing. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't remember that. But now that you say that, I'm like, that does seem kind of right. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, we have one plan for one hour, but I think that we can stay uh, on if, uh, you know, uh, if uh, we want to chat more. Uh, but before, Probably before we end the, the formal program, uh, I would let all the panelists to say just one sentence to end <laughs> the session. Uh, anything you want to add or to? Um... No? I still just love this department. <laughs> Thank you. I do too. But I think, yeah, I think a lot of people said you. You have to be your own advocate and believe in yourself. And eventually other people will take you, ser people will take you as seriously as you take yourself. And so I've had to realize that. So if you, you know, you take yourself seriously and try your best and other people will take you seriously too. And I think just kind of what Laura said, but to just keep following what you're most interested in at the time, like just keep some blinders on and, and follow your passion and what you're interested and curious about. And that's really, I think, the best way to be happy and successful. Thank you all so much. Uh, Amin, do you have something uh, to, to well, add? Well, uh, three things, and I'll keep it short. The, the uh, first of all, I think this is evidence that we have exceptional women in, in our department and we've had exceptional women throughout. Uh, and all you have to do is look at some of the leadership roles that some of our previous uh, graduates have, have taken. So uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't help but be prouder in, in being part of this organization. And then on the personal level, just uh, uh, two stories. Katie, unfortunately, I don't have a story for you. So you're gonna get, you're, you're gonna get uh, a, a pass on this. So Laura, uh, is, as you can tell, a bubbly personality. And um, one year we were uh, hosting our advisory board, our national advisory board, and there was a football game. And so we had a football game after that. And we <laughs> invited some, uh, invited our advisory board members, uh, leaders of the industry, uh, captains of the industry, and uh, students. And Laura came, came over to our house and her contribution was two sheets of jello shots. Now, I don't know if you know what a jello shot is. I had heard of that since I was a teenager. But anyway, it was a hit with some of our older advisory board members. Um, so you need to keep like a balance and that youthful enthusiasm. And now the other, the other story is uh, the Harley story, which, it, which uh, fits into uh, being assertive and self-aware, uh, there's something called a, a, a Harley withdrawal. And it, it goes like this. When Harley started her PhD thesis, she said, you know, I, I might be a little bit of a pain because I, I tend to come by. So we set up weekly meetings. Apparently Harley's definition of a weekly meeting and my anticipation of weekly meeting are two different things. So every day, sort of for a half an hour, sometimes around lunch, sometimes not, Harley would stop by and tell, us what, tell me what she was doing. And so you, 
got used to that and actually would look forward to it. Then Harley decided to follow her husband and go to Washington, D.C. And so for the first two months, I was sitting there looking at the clock at the window around noon, waiting for Harley to stop by. Um, she did, we did make up with some phone calls, but it certainly did, it certainly did uh, it leave, it leave an impression. And then, of course, and I don't know if this is re a reflection on her Chevron days, but Harley would make cookies. <laughs> Yeah. I didn't make cookies for that group because I didn't like them. <laughs> she would make cookies. Only so, make cookies for those who deserve it, right? Exactly. I was too so, busy uh, anyway. Yeah, yeah. In summary, I, 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 uh, when, when I was in many, many years ago, when I was a student in the department, we had uh, one, one female student. And I, don't think that there's any question we were a much better department for the presence of the, of the women and um, the women students, the women faculty. So I, I think it's uh, just wonderful to see and I encourage everybody to, to uh, uh, continue doing that. And again, uh, follow your passion. Hopefully your passion has something to do with the uh, uh, water and the marine industry. Well, thank you, Ami. Thank you, Linda, for being here with us. Yeah, it has been a great, I really enjoyed this session. So again, thank Laura, Hallie and Katie and uh, all the other participants. Uh, thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. This is wonderful. Good. Yeah, this is wonderful. I still yeah. use my Michigan email. I was the only Harley when I started. So I'm always looking for new PhD students well, also looking for funding. Hi. So if anybody <laughs> wants to come to the Netherlands, send me an email and I'll, uh, while well, I'm working on the funding part. So Harley at UMich, there it is. Send me an email. All right. Yeah. You take that rain check. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Yeah, you too. I got to take off. Uh, Bye. Yeah. yeah. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. All.